Okay, so last time we were talking about mechanisms with correlated information. We argued that if you are looking at domain strategy implementation, correlation in agent information does not change your approach at all. Because if you are doing dominant strategy implementation, you do not care about the distributions of types. Your IC conditions are just so strong that your IC conditions that you want to get in the mechanism, they're so strong that well, they basically shut down any, uh, any channels through which you can exploit correlation between agents information. However, the story is completely different when we are talking about Bayesian implementation and Bayesian incentive compatible mechanisms. There we saw in two different contexts that you can very easily exploit this correlation to extract full information from your agents and implement any, uh, any allocation rule that you want. So we did two examples. Uh, firstly, we looked at the case with perfect correlation of reports, perfect correlations or F types of different players. And there we saw that, well, uh, the, a very simple mechanism that you can use is the cross verification mechanism. So you can ask all players to report their types. And if these reports do not coincide perfectly, as they should on equilibrium path, you can punish them by either um, assigning very bad transfers to all of them, so asking them to pay uh, many million money to the mechanism, or by implementing a very, very bad allocation if you do not have access to transfers and there is some kind of bad allocation, like detonate a nuke, which everybody supposedly would dislike. Uh, then we looked at the case of imperfect correlation, uh, which is the kramer mclean paper. And we talked just a lot about what is the condition on the distribution of types that you need there to do basically the same thing. So in the kramer mclean mechanism, what you do is you, again, employ some kind of cross-verification mechanism, but instead of, well, directly checking whether reports coincide, because most of the time they wouldn't, you, you do this in a stochastic way. So you ask players to bet on one another's reports. Uh, and this way you can elicit each player's belief about the distribution of other players' types. And with this way, you can once again implement any given allocation you want. And the condition on the distribution of types under which you can do all of this uh, basically says that, well, every separate type must have a different belief about other players' types. And furthermore, they must be linearly independent, these beliefs of different types. Yeah, so what we're doing today is we're looking at the case when players' types are perfectly correlated, but the, but the principle not only has no X transfers, but the principle can also not commit to any kind of allocation rule. So basically, this cross-verification mechanism that we just recalled would not work here. The principle cannot commit to make agents pay a lot of money. The principle cannot commit to implement a very bad allocation of the equilibrium path in case of mismatching reports. And we will look at a very particular model of this, and we will see that there is something you can do in that case as well. Well, this will be uh, an example based on a paper by Marco Battaglini from 2003. It was not, oh yeah, and uh, it's not in the textbook, so you can read the original textbook, but I tried to make the slides once again as comprehensive as possible. So this paper is not even framed as a mechanism design paper because we are so far out of the realm of mechanism design. We have no transfers, we have no commitments. So is it really a mechanism design problem? But I thought it would be really illustrative to look at this because it, again, continues the trend of the previous two papers really nicely. And in this, uh, in this example, the model is as follows. We have two agents, one and two, and they both know some state, which is given by a two-dimensional uh, point, a point in a two-dimensional plane. And this is, in a sense, related to the information elicitation example that we did last week. So we have these experts that know the truth, uh, and we are trying to elicit that truth from them. Except, yeah, except it's different in that now they know the true state, not just the distribution of state. So it's more standard in that respect. 
So both of these agents know the state, and each of them uh, send some report to a principal. And we just uh, say that this report should also be a pair of coordinates. So it's kind of a direct revelation mechanism. We think that the agents will reveal the state. Our designer, or the principal, as usual, does not know the state, but he has some prior belief about the distribution. Um, well, no, actually not. Here we do not really care about the distribution itself. Just think that any state on the two-dimensional plane is possible. That's all we are thinking of. And so this principal does not know the state, but this principal will be listening to the experts' reports, M1 and M2, so two pairs of coordinates. And after hearing those reports, the principal will implement some action on the two-dimensional plane. The principal's goal is to match the state. So the principal's utility function is given by the distance between the action that he takes and the true state. And this double, this norm is the Euclidean norm, so it's the Euclidean distance. Yeah, so Euclidean distance is given by the square root of the squares of distances in each coordinate. If x is a pair of coordinates, x1 and x2, then the norm, the Euclidean norm of vector x, is the, yeah, the square root of squares of its coordinates. Remember in school geometry lessons. So, so the principal wants to minimize the norm of the distance between the action and the true state, while the two agents have different biases, bi, so b1 and b2 respectively. And they want to, they want the principal's action to match this biased state, so state omega plus bi. So biases bi are commonly known, so both all agents and the principal know both experts' biases. And just for annotation, I tried to make it, make it somewhat systematic. So subscripts, lower indices, uh, denote players. Superscripts, superscripts stand for coordinates. So like x1, x2 is a pair of coordinates. And the state omega1, omega2 is a coordinate, is a pair of coordinates too. Uh, this is the model. Any questions about the model? Cool. So you see, this is a somewhat specific example. We have very specific utilities. We have, uh, yeah, I guess utilities are the most restrictive part of this. Uh, but in the original paper, what I clearly cover a slightly more general example of this. So the intuition of it uh, will be, as usual, slightly more general that I will present. So then I will present. And as I said, this was not originally uh, covered as a, presented as a mechanism design problem, because what people mostly understand as a mechanism design problem is this, what we call the level two problem. We want to design transfers to implement some allocation rule k. But in principle, you can see this problem as a level one problem, where we do not have access to transfers, but we want to check whether a given allocation rule k is implementable. So the allocation rule that we would like to implement in this case would be not the truth telling, but rather the perfect action. So the a of omega equal to omega. So this would be the desired allocation rule. And we want to implement that. But as I said, it, it is still, even in this interpretation, not quite a mechanism design problem because we cannot commit to a mechanism. So we cannot commit to uh, actions in case of mismatching reports. Even uh, if you're somewhat proficient in game theory, this should still beg a question that, you know, we can in principle assign any beliefs to off-path actions. So if mismatching reports 
are not on equilibrium path, then the principal would not really know what to think after these reports. So you can assign beliefs to this um, to this profile of reports, saying that you know this action will be plus a million plus a million. But the truth is, even if you assign these kind of beliefs that would justify that off path action. Whenever the state is, for example, a million, a million minus B1, one of the agents would like to deviate to that off path belief, to that off path report. Sorry. So we can we cannot really find a good a good profile of off path actions. And even if even though that would formally help us implement a mechanism, we still want to you know, do it in a more fair way. We want to actually provide incentives to the players to report the state truthfully. So the question is, how do we do that? And the question is, we should ask the agents to not report the full state, because then they would almost always want to deviate one way or another, depending on how we specify these beliefs of the equilibrium path. But we might ask them to report only some aspect of the state, such that by combining the two reports, we would learn the whole truth about the state. So what if we ask every player to report one coordinate of the state? Could that work? And the answer is yes and no. So we would no because why would it in general? But we will find such coordinates along which truthful reporting would be pro uh, optimal for both agents. Now a slight detour. Uh, this, as I said many times already, this was not originally framed as a mechanism design problem, but it was originally framed as a communication problem. And uh, Part of the reason why this is just a meaningful question in communication models is that in games of communication with cheap talk, meaning where agents can report anything and they do not bear any cost from lying and they do not get any benefit from reporting any, any direct benefit from reporting any particular thing, except for how it influences others. These games have a lot of equilibrium principle. So yeah, the main reason behind it is that it takes two to mingle. So if you are not willing to listen to me, I cannot convey useful information to you, and vice versa. If I am just speaking gibberish, then you with all desire would not be able to extract any information from my speech. So what this leads to is the fact that if we have a completely uninformative equilibrium in which I am talking gibberish and you are not listening, would be an equilibrium, even if both of us would prefer to move to a more, more informative equilibrium, right? Because neither I can switch to a more informative equilibrium unilaterally, nor you can switch to you know, trying to extract information from my speech because there is any. So which requires a coordinated effort to switch from one equilibrium to another, from an uninformative equilibrium to a more informative equilibrium. Uh, yeah. And the same applies to slightly more informative equilibrium, moderately informative equilibrium, and so on. So if there is an equilibrium that is not the most informative, then it would be an equilibrium because neither player would be able to switch unilaterally to a more informative equilibrium. That's the big idea. Uh, I, I just found this um, quote a couple of weeks ago, and I want to show it to you as an illustration of that. So this is a quote from a Wikipedia article on the origins of language. It says, look, uh, 
monkeys and apes are in exactly that no communication equilibrium. So they cannot switch to um, more informative equilibrium exactly because words are not immediately verifiable. So what this means for us is that our problem here is effectively that of equilibrium selection. So we are trying to find a language in which our experts would report truthfully, or maybe partial truth, not the full truth, not the full truth but they would have no incentive to deviate. All right. Uh, now let's get to solving it with the wonderful, with the wonderful hand-drawn graphs. So the game would look as follows. So these are the two coordinates. This is the plane on which we exist. Remember, our state, omega, is on a plane. Our reports are on a plane. Our action will be on this plane. So the way this problem is formed, we have this trio of points. Omega, omega plus b1, and omega plus b2. So the bliss points of the three players. So this is what the uh, principal would like to do in a given state, omega. This is what expert one would prefer the principal to do. This is what the expert two would prefer the principal to do. And these three points will always be in this configuration. We just don't know where exactly they are on the plane. Now the circles here, the blue and the red ones respectively, are the indifference curves for the agents. So the expert one would like to implement, would like the principle to implement action omega plus b1, but if that does not work, then he is indifferent between any actions on this circle, which are better than any action on this circle, and so on. You know how indifferent curves work by now. But they will be somewhat useful in our analysis. Okay, so the way we will solve this problem is we will find an axis, this purple one, which is orthogonal to the player's bias. So for example, for player B1, his bias is this, or I guess this arrow, this vector. So if we ask him to report something, the coordinate of the state that is orthogonal to this bias, then this expert will have an incentive to report truthfully. And the way this manifests itself on the graph is we ask player um, so for example yeah let's see it this way let's suppose that our player one can choose any point on this purple line on this axis which point will he choose you see that the kind of the highest indifference curve that still overlaps or is tangent to this purple line is this one so exactly the one um, And it is tangent to the purple line at exactly the same point uh, at which the projection of the bias state lies uh, on this purple line. Where does the purple line come from? So the purple line is an axis that is orthogonal to the player's bias. There are infinitely many to choose from, and that's why we have player two, but we'll get to that. Yes. So for now, just say that we have a purple line that is going through the origin, right? We ask the, uh, the player to project the state on this line, so we want him to ask to, to report this projection. In truth, our agent can choose effectively any action on this purple line, but he will choose this exact action that we want them to implement, so he will make this exact report, because this is where the highest indifference curve is tangent to this axis. So this is the hardest conceptual point of this model. So in this graph, we just do the same for player two. We say that if we fix this purple line anywhere, say it goes through the origin two, 
So then player two will also report truthfully. Uh, let me see what I written here. Yeah, so with two players, we can learn both coordinates of the state this way, as long as their biases are linearly dependent. So their biases are going different directions. There is a more general result here. There's, the intuition is more general than this example. And in particular, it says that if agents have fixed biases, then with n-dimensional state, you can extract all but one dimension uh, of the truth. So if the truth is very multifaceted, you can learn it almost completely from any single agent. You just ask them to frame their response, or you just frame the question in a way that is orthogonal to their bias. Uh, yeah, and uh, the paper does that. Asmus? Yeah, so the question is, uh, we can easily choose the purple lines given the biases, but how do we know the biases in the real world? So the first answer is, in this model, we have assumed that biases are common knowledge. In uh, reality, yeah, it depends on the problem. So in some problems, you can guess what the bias is. For example, if I'm talking with a car salesman, I know that his bias is to, towards selling me the car that may or may not be good for me. If I'm talking with um, a dentist, again, his bias is towards selling me more expensive services and so on. So most of the time you can guess at least the direction of the bias, or not guess, but just infer from the context. The magnitude of the bias might be unknown, but in this example, in this setting, you do not even care about the magnitude of the bias, so long as you know the direction. Uh, the examples with car and dentist can be two-dimensional. Say, there is a, uh, if we frame actions as one dimension, which car I buy, and the second is how many optional upgrades I get for that car, you can say that, um, Maybe car salesmen benefit more from these optional uh, from these options rather than from actually selling cars. So they would be biased towards probably selling me worse car but with better options. That would be a two-dimensional example. Bliss points are a little more difficult in this example. I agree. As I said, the magnitude of the biases does not really matter. So what you can think is that uh, the bias goes infinitely in, in some direction. I guess this could be an answer to our question. Or alternatively, biases come from just some other aspect of interaction. Say, car dealerships need to care about their reputation just a little bit, maybe, so they don't want to charge you infinitely. Or maybe they, they realize that you have some IR constraint. So if they try to give you a Traban with 20-inch wheels, you will probably realize that something is fishy here. You know, something like that. But yeah, yeah. This, this is a very special example, and I agree with that. But in the end, this is how our problem looks like. So this is how we combine the two reports. Here, suppose that our realized state is here. And so the second player where it was asked to report the coordinates of the second state along this line. So he reported O2. It will not be the actual projection, it will be O2. We'll see that in a second. So it's not directly the orthogonal projection. So with this O2, what is the choice that, the, that expert one faces? Expert one chooses between different actions on this green line. And this green line is parallel to the original purple line that we had for player one, but it is now at coordinate O2. And which action from this green line will, will our player one select? Well, we made it so, as it will turn out, the tangent point will be exactly at how many. So we will, uh, after the break, we'll do a quick example on that because that probably was too abstract, right? Uh, but the main idea that I want you to take away from this model, from the simple example, 
if you have no instruments to elicit private information from the agents, but you have many agents, you can still set them against each other. Even if you cannot directly cross-verify their reports, but they have some different biases, you can put these biases and play, uh, play them against one another to extract all the information that you want. Let's do an example of uh, this of this Bottiglini model example. So what we need to do, what we need to start with, is we need to have two biases. And we'll just solve this with, with arbitrary biases. So give me four numbers. Cool. So three, four, five, two. And the true state will be four and three. Thank you. Cool. Now let's let's try to solve it. So the solution algorithm is pretty much on the slide. And the first thing we start with is we need to find these purple lines. So we need to find their direction. In linear algebra, it's called the basis. So it's our new coordinate system in which we will measure the reports of the agents. So we need to find the basis C1, C2 such that the respective CI is orthogonal to the respective bias DI. Which means, in plain terms, that their inner product is zero. Which means that, for example, for C1, we need to solve the system C11 times 3 plus C12 times 4 equals zero. One equation, two unknowns. So it's, as you can see, we have one degree of uncertainty, meaning that we know the direction of the vector, but we do not know the, the length of the vector. So if you are very, uh, very perfectionist with your linear algebra, you can put another restriction that the length of this vector is one. I do not care about this for now, so we'll not do that. So let's take three and four. Can somebody solve this system for me? Just give me one solution, a solution. Minus four and three. That looks right to me. And the same for C2. C2 one times five plus C2 two times two must be equal to zero. So C2 will be equal to we can do that by analogy, pretty much. Minus 2 and 5, for example, could be one of them. So and now what we do is we ask the agents to decompose the state in this basis. Meaning, we want to ask agents to Calculate uh, coordinates O1, O2, and these coordinates represent our state omega in this new basis. This is equivalent to saying that omega equals O1 times C1 plus O2 times C2, or using just a little bit of vector notation. C1 is minus 4, 3. O2 is minus 2 and 5. And our omega is 4 and 3. So this is now equivalent to a system of two equations with two unknowns. Namely, you can write this as 4 equals minus 4, O1, minus 2, O2. And 3 equals 301 plus 502. Now, once again, I ask you to solve this system. So find me 01 and 02. Negatives 13 over 7 and 12 over 7. So the bottom line is if these are the biases, then what you will want to do 
in this problem is you will ask the agents to calculate these coordinates L1 and L2 and make sure to brief them on linear algebra to make sure that they calculate those correctly. And you will ask player 1 report O1 and player 2 report O2. I'm sure there is a way we can write this down formally, saying that O1 is you know, this expression of, of omega and Cs, and O2 is this other expression, but I think it's enough to give you this idea. Now, a few final words about, uh, about this model, about this example. Firstly, uh, as I mentioned, there are many different vectors CI that are orthogonal to any given bias, BI. And as I said, you can select pretty much any of them. So we selected arbitrary vectors. Then another thing is that formally the problem setup says that messages are two-dimensional reports, while in our case we just asked people to report a single number. So you can say that you ask them to report this number and zero. And anything else is bad in some way. Or alternatively, the other way to encode this effective equilibrium is to say that both agents do report full state, omega, but the principle extracts these coordinates from the agent's states. So in this way, you would not need agents to, co to calculate these biases, unless they are calculated through their deviations. But basically, that uh, interpretation also tells us what the principle will think of the equilibrium path. So if there are two mismatching reports, then the principle will take coordinates O1 from the first report and coordinate O2 from the second report and implement the resulting action. <laughs>